اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ القاسم الجبارین الحمدللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على عشرف الانبیاء والمخلوقین سیدنا و نبینا و شفینا بالقاسم محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ رِدَمْ بِقَذَائِ وَتَسْلِيمًا لِعَمْرِ Sisters and brothers, السلام علیکم to this, welcome to this second talk and we will have one tomorrow and one on Friday so it will be four inshallah um, so the subject we have chosen is to look at the broader category of the followers and supporters of the Ahlul Bayt and Imam Ali السلام, in particular. Because up to now we have generally been focusing on only the Isna Ashari tradition. But I think uh, we have to begin to appreciate the other traditions and other followers who have also um, contributed greatly to the preserving of the heritage of Imam Ali salam. So yesterday we set a general scene of many of the <coughs> themes which we need to understand like things like uh, Sufism and other things which will form the context of some of these groups. Today in uh, particular we want to look at <coughs> three groups which are also in the news presently. One is the Alawis of Turkey. Of course, as the name suggests, they derive their name from Imam Ali alayhi salam. The second one is the Alawites of Syria and partly Turkey. So these are two different things. Again, Alawites take their name from Imam Ali alayhi salam. And the third one are the Druze community in Syria and Lebanon. And uh, we shall see the, the different traditions and origins of these three groups and how they blend into the uh, religious and political life of those countries over the years, right? The important thing here <coughs> as we saw yesterday, is that there are some overriding themes which we also need to, to look at. One of them, which is very, very relevant to how they behaved and how they sort of preserved or not preserved their faith, is the fact of the Crusades. Now, most of you obviously would have heard about the Crusades that the Christians from Europe, after a long period of defeat and subjugation, decided to go back and uh, launch a crusade to reconquer Jerusalem. But when you think about it very deeply, you see some very important uh, realizations. An army of that size coming from Europe, going all across Europe into Palestine, is not like an army of today. For example, when the uh, Americans went into Afghanistan, they had to establish a logistical and supply base through Pakistan, which was 
like thousands of camps, lorries, food supplies, all kinds of things which an army will need when it is going forward. Now these people, when going on horses mainly, would not be able to carry that kind of supplies across Europe. So their strategy and their uh, actually operational mod, uh, mode was to pillage and loot the people on the way. As they went from place to place, they would murder some of them, loot them, subjugate them and move on and so the next people and next people abuse the women and all kinds of atrocities just to advance themselves. So this in itself shows you what sort of a Christian mission there was. It corrupts the mission as it goes on. And so most of these people from Turkey up to Palestine were subject to the brutality of the Crusades before, of course, they were turned back. And this brought an additional layer of suppression onto the Muslims, right? Whichever color they were, Sunni, Shia, whatever. So all the Muslims were also subjected to that brutality. And uh, we will see sometimes this presented opportunities and sometimes obstacles to the followers of Imam Ali. And this is something which we need to keep very much in the background. Another thing which we saw towards the end of uh, yesterday's discussion was this idea of the differential treatment of the Mawali, of the non-Arab converts to Islam or people who accepted Islam but who were not Arab. And we know uh, from our <coughs> general uh, listening to all kinds of lectures and majalis that really in Islam there is no difference between Arab and Ajam. Well, Ajam means non-Arab, right? So, and this is, but in practice, especially under the Umayyads, this was not applied. There was in practice a difference in treatment, both in terms of Entitlements from the Baitul Mal, distribution of all kinds of wealth and so on, uh, entitlements to land, cultivation rights and all kinds of things. So one of the underlying themes of the followers of Imam Ali have always been that there has been a belief that he would be the one who would be the most fair in this respect and he wouldn't discriminate between the Arab and Ajab. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> this was something which we will not take it up in this series, but sometimes, inshallah, we have time. We will take up when we look at the role of Abu Zar, Abu Zar Ghaffari or Salman Farsi in the, amongst the companions uh, of the Prophet. <clears throat> so, again, this would mean that a lot of the marginalized or oppressed people would tend towards supporting Imam Ali. A lot of the established chiefs and so on would not. And so there was this tension always in most countries where um, the supporters of Imam Ali tended to come from those kind of people who were not Arabs but who also felt that Islam was for everybody and should be uh, equal towards everybody. Okay, so just keep those things in mind because that might help us to... This is a very complicated theme, unfortunately. I am trying to make it as simple as possible for us. But uh, there are some things which cannot be simplified further. Okay, so three countries will feature in these three uh, groups we want to see. One is Turkey, one is Syria, and the third one is Lebanon. It's in these three countries that most of the, 
these three groups live at the present time. Okay, historically they have been in other places, but at the present time, they are in these three places. And <coughs> recent developments in the politics of these countries make it even more important to understand their origins and their status. So let us look at Turkey. Turkey, of course, in its Muslim history, most of it has been under Ottoman rule. The Uthmani Caliphs ruled Turkey. And finally, the Khilafat was abolished in uh, 1924 by uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was more Turkish nationalist. And so Turkish Turkey was established as a secular republic on that, in that time. However, the population of Turkey consists of three main groups and some smaller groups, right? Of course, the biggest group are uh, Sunni Muslims, uh, mostly Hanafis. And then there is a significant minority of Alawis. And then, of course, there are Kurds. Kurds can be Sunnis, but mostly they won't be Hanafis, they would be Shafis. And they can be Alawis. And they can be in Iraq especially, and some parts of Turkey, what we call Fuailis, which means Ethnasheris. So Kurds are also a mixed. But in Turkey, about, and this is something which is becoming more and more relevant in Turkey at the moment, that Turkish, Turkish population is about 80 million. Now, normally, you would think of Turkey as a fully Hanafi Sunni state. But anything from 30 to 40 percent of the Turkish population is not Hanafi Sunni. 15 to 20 percent is Alawi, and another 15 to 20 percent are Kurds. So you have 30 to 40 percent who are not part of the Turkish system, right? Now, in the last 15, 20 years, the uh, state established by Kamal Ataturk has been uh, shaken. And you have the emergence of the AKP or the Islamic Party again under uh, Tayyip Erdogan. And one would think that it has been a, a Hanafi state, again, which with Ottoman, sort of neo-Ottoman tendencies. However, <clears throat> and they won two elections with a majority, comfortably. After three years, after three terms, sorry, Erdogan had to uh, give up the prime ministership because that's the constitution. And then he went for the presidency. Now obviously in Turkey, in the new Turkey, uh, the power rests mostly with the prime minister. So Erdogan wants to shift some power to the president. For that, he needs a two-third majority in the parliament. So in the last election, <coughs> He tried to do that. They called an election. They tried to see that they could get a two-third majority. However, for the first time, uh, well, the opposition to uh, AKP in Turkey has always been dominated by the Alawis. So at the moment, for example, the main opposition party, out of 83 members of parliament, I think 57 are Alawis. 
and the, the leader of the opposition party is an Alawi as well. Uh, what has been absent has been the uh, presence of the Kurds in parliament. Because the Turkish constitution says that unless you get 10% of the vote, you get no seats. Once you cross the 10% threshold, you get the proportionate seats. And last time, the Kurds for the first time crossed that threshold. And therefore, the uh, AKP, the Turkish uh, Muslim party, was not able to get the two-thirds majority and change the constitution as they wanted. And they started to form a coalition government and things, but it failed. Another election has been called for the 1st of November because Erdogan thinks that he can still get that. Why I'm relating this history to you is that you can see that the role of the Alawis is going to be critical to that process, whether they could do it or not. And if not, how will the instability feature? That might result in repression of the Alawis again, or the, the repression of the Kurds has started already. So that's one thing keep in mind, that the Alawis are at the moment central to the political structure of Turkey. And Turkey itself, Turkish state, is at least a third and maybe 40% not uh, Hanafi Sunni, or not Ottoman, or not Neo-Ottoman, or whatever you want to call it. Whenever this has happened in the past, the loyalty of the Alawis to the Turkish state has been called into question. And, and this may also presage some things which are coming. The second problem which the Turkish state has is with the Kurds. The Kurds have been looking for independence for a long time. And they have been trying to align with the Kurds in Iraq and Syria and potentially Iran. So they want a whole Kurdish state. Very few of the Kurds are Shia, except for Iraq, where there are about 10 to 15 percent of the Kurds are for Ali Shias. Mostly others are uh, Shafis. And Turkey has been fighting with the Kurds. Now you can see the reaction of Turkey in the case of Syria. Um, the Kurdish part of Syria is bordering with Turkey. Turkey was reluctant to help that part against these Daesh fellows because it, it fears that the mixture of Iraqi and Syrian Kurds with the Turkish Kurds will, will create that problem. So there is a tension there always and the Alawis also will play a critical role on how that is resolved. <clears throat> Having said that, let us look at other things which form this Alawi community. So what is the origin <clears throat> and what are the beliefs of these people? And this is called a very, very complex set of uh, beliefs and structures. And, and, and we should, looking at all these three groups and maybe other groups as well, there are two ways of judging somebody's belief, right? One is saying, okay, what do you believe in? And you say, I believe in X, Y, Z, and you say, fine, this falls within the fold or not. The other one could be looking at their actions and seeing whether they do some basic things like prayer or fasting or whatever. And if they don't, say they fall outside. Um, from time to time, this has been decided on different basis, right? Some people sometimes have decided that this is what they say. And therefore, so for example, when we look at uh, <coughs> in uh, Islamic economics, right? We say that, okay. Uh, Pakistan says that we have converted everything to Islamic. Okay, you say so, so it is. 
But when you look at it, nothing has changed. So now say, okay, if you look at it, it's not. So it depends how you want to judge it. Similarly here. But originally, <coughs> and uh, there are clear indications that the belief is on 12 Imams in the line of Imam Ali alayhi salam. But it has also been infused with Sufi doctrines from the Bektashi order. Bektashis are uh, one of the dominant order in, uh, in Turkey. And in terms of practice, they do not have formal mosques at all. Although they observe the Ashura, they observe the birthday of Imam Ali, um, they observe bits and pieces here. They fast. They don't think fasting in Ramadan is compulsory. But they fast the first 10 days of Muharram. Um, and they have uh, <coughs> uh, meeting places which they call Kemri or Semri or, you know, gathering halls, really. But in the evenings. And they say that the experience they have there is like the mirage of the Prophet. It's like a supernatural experience. And that's enough for their spiritual upliftment. So they don't put that much emphasis on prayers, daily prayers or fasting. Hajj, some of them go, some of them don't bother. Um, they celebrate Nauruz very assiduously. Uh, obviously, Nauruz has a multiple uh, um, connotations, uh, but the origin is clearly in the Northern Hemisphere. It is the uh, first day of spring, and therefore, uh, if you like, beginning of new life in terms of crops and all kinds of things. So this is, makes sense that this is a... and. Uh, um, in general, we see that uh, early Muslims did not find anything wrong with celebrating that because this is, this is it's not paganism or anything, it's just a natural phenomena which you are. But I don't know how you would celebrate the same day in the Southern Hemisphere, right? Because that, that's a complete reverse. So you might have to change the date. That will be left for the Iranians to reach there at some stage. But at the moment, I think in those places, Nauru's where there is sympathy for... Generally, when you have uh, this kind of situations, you see that there is also veneration for Salman Farsi as one of the key companions of the Prophet. So, <clears throat> you can see now this mix, but they say clearly that we follow the 12 Imams. And we believe in the Quran. And so and so forth. So now, how do you judge them? Do you judge them as within the fold or outside the fold? We leave that question open. From time to time, different scholars have said, we can only say what they say. If they say we are, they are. We can't judge their practice. But one important contribution of the Alawi tradition in Turkey, or what, what now is Turkey in those times, is actually the spread of Shiism in Iran, in Safavi times. And this was through a Sufi order called the Kizilbash. Um, I think last time we discussed some of it, but in fact, if we have time tomorrow, we will look at it a bit more. But essentially, uh, Shah Ismail, who was the first Safavi king, was a leader of this group in Turkey, in that part. And through all kinds of happenings, 
he proclaimed as the successor of the seventh imam and uh, uh, or you know like not successor in the sense of but in sort of um, inspired to be successor of the seventh imam so it was it's always confusing in iranian history whether he actually said he's the successor or he is just following and eventually they uh, defeated the ottoman state's rule over iran, iran and took over the whole of iran and this was with the help of the kizilbash who were of course uh, alawis in their orientation and is nashiri in their beliefs and then proceeded to convert the whole of iran to shiism so this is a big contribution from them shah ismail uh, uh, and uh, his safavi successors then went to do something else which is also part of the story but that's another part they recruited ulama from jabal amil in lebanon jabal amil means the mountains of amil in lebanon to come and propagate true shiism in iran so again is through this kizilbash chain that the whole thing came into iran before that there were pockets of shiism in iran so around um, always there has been a long established tradition in uh, what was called shahr re but uh, it's now south of tehran really and qom and in khorasan other than that isfahan maybe little bits there was mostly hanafi sunnism safavis 500 years ago made it fully 12 were shi apart from the kurds who still stay and and some minority sunni tribes in baluchistan and so on Okay. So we can say in a real sense that that survival of that tradition in the Ottomans through the Kizilbash came to spread Shiism in in Iran. Okay. And we don't know what will happen as I said the politics is quite uh, complex. There are reports which say that I'm not uh, I haven't verified this but I have read this that Imam Khomeini himself uh considered these people to be Shi's Dalavis so there we have it Now because of their role in the helping the Safavis because those of you who know history will see that after the establishment of safavid iran the ottoman and safavi empires became very serious rivals and obviously the spoil was iraq in the middle right so it was always a battle between the two so the turkish sunnis have always treated the alawis with suspicion that these guys can't trust their trust their loyalty they might give it to the shia fellow shia religionists right and this has resulted in greater suppression and so on so the alawis have always voted for a secular state in turkey they don't want a religious state because they think a religious state will bring suppression on them because it will be hanafi dominated and therefore there will be suppression uh, this tension is coming to the fore at the moment we don't know what will happen but we can see that the role of the alawis through the ages has been quite critical and their belief system is quite varied and confusing for us but still centered on the central role of imam ali in their theology okay the next group we want to look at are the Alawites now these are two different the Alawis and the Alawites they are not the same most people many people when they read they think this is all one kind of thinking it is not the Alawites are more in uh, Syria 
which is uh, where the present conflict is centered. And they constitute about 12% of the Syrian population. So Syrian population is about 22 million. So these people will be just under 2 million. They also have a small minority in Turkey. So in addition to Alevis, they have also Alevites. The Alevites, characteristic of the Alevites is that they are Arabic speaking. They don't speak Turkish or, they may speak Turkish as a second language, but they are Arabic speaking. And they are mostly in the western coast of Syria, towards the port of Latakia and so on. In terms of their belief system, they also claim to be Isnashri Shi'is. They say we follow the 12 Imams and so on. But then on top, they say that the particular manifestation of Allah in Muslim history is by a threefold, uh, like a Trinity between Imam Ali alayhi salam, the Prophet, and Salman Farsi. So uh, they, of course, bring Salman Farsi because the founder of the Alevite uh, tradition was a man called Ibn Nusayr from uh, Taylam in Iran. Uh, in the ninth century. That's why sometimes they are also called Nusairis. But uh, more and more they are called Alawites because they want to show their allegiance to Imam Ali. Now they <clears throat> and this is very very interesting here. Um, the Crusaders considered the Alevis in Turkey as completely against them and therefore siding with the Muslims. The Alevites on the other hand, the Crusaders sometimes considered them to be non-Muslims and therefore some people who can be relied upon to attack Muslims. You know, as I said, the Crusader strategy was to get as much of their supply lines from the people whom they... So, this judgment of the crusaders must have been made on practice or whatever. Again, the Alawites claim themselves to be completely uh, Muslim and Shia, but they don't have mosques and they don't have normal religious practice as we know it. So this has presented a challenge. And they were, in Syria, they were marginalized people. So they were mostly living in the hills and, uh, you know, scavenging and uh, eking out a very tough living. Gradually, when the French came, you know, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, Syria and Lebanon and was given to France as a mandate. Palestine was given to British as a mandate state. So French were the rulers for some time. And they started to <coughs> um, build an Alawite kind of state on the western coast. But after independence, two uh, uh, problems happened. One, there was the rise of what we call Arab nationalism. So you know that for a period of time, Syria and Egypt became united under what it was called the United Arab Republic. Uh, for three years it lasted and after that it fell apart. But it also brought to fore very, very strong, if you like, uh, Sunni sentiments in this picture and so the Alawites were suppressed more. However, <clears throat> As Ibn Khaldun explains in his Muqaddimah, when people become wealthy and they become well off, they don't want their children to join the army. 
because they could pay somebody else to mend the army right so unfortunately for them in syria they found these poor alawites in the mountains their children to be the best and cheapest recruitment for the army so over a period of 30 40 years the syrian army became predominantly alawite dominated and eventually after turmoil and upheavals uh, hafiz al assad the father of the present bashar al assad took over because the army was his his people were in the army so we can take it over he took over the state so a minority took over the state just because the majority didn't have any will to join the army in the main yeah of course there are uh, people there and so since then they have dominated the state of syria now again as i said they claim to be 12er shia muslims and therefore if you want to take it on face value that's what it is but politics has played a role here and here we need to i need to bring forward a personality of uh, uh, which some of you may have heard but we need to also figure him in his name is said musa sadr said musa sadr from lebanon was a charismatic figure and in uh 1980 if i'm not mistaken just after the revolution uh, in iran he went for a visit to libya and was kidnapped and has never been seen since then so it is generally believed that gaddafi killed him for reasons which we don't know okay but before uh, when said musa sadr was there and we'll come to lebanon next when we look at the druze but generally he was the one who mobilized the shia in lebanon and organized them so that they could get their due share of power before that the shia had no power in lebanon and we will come to that as i said the role of said musa sadr but in syria after hafiz assad took over there was a constitutional problem because <coughs> although the constitution was secular there was one clause which was left that the president of the country must be a muslim and said musa sadr that time gave a ruling that hafiz al assad was a or not hafiz al assad but the alawites were a community of 12er shia muslims and so that problem was solved constitutionally and since then it has been up and down however in history as i said because of the uh linkage with the crusaders and the behavior and so on somebody like ghazali for example treats them as non muslim seriously non muslim uh you would expect somebody like ibn taymiyah obviously because ibn taymiyah treated anybody who believed in imam ali to be a problem to be non muslim but interestingly the sunni grand mufti of jerusalem classified them as muslims so there you have it but in the shaping of syria's uh future and politics culture i don't think the alawites have played as big a role as the alawis have played in turkey because they have been always a minority and in that sense when they have ruled they have ruled as a dictatorship so even presently one of the problems is that uh in judging what what stands to take on syria is that which is the lesser evil not which is good or bad and that's a judgment call for different countries who have to make it okay to summarize in terms of their beliefs they have clear linkages obviously to imam ali and so on 
but the practice is very very much absent and here there is another distinction which we need to look at and that is the question of uh, what is termed the batini tradition the um, well as, as the name says zahir means what is apparent batin is what is hidden and um, there is a deep discussion within islam as to whether everything should be apparent there could be some things which are in the heart in the soul and when on friday we look at the fatimis we will see that tension even greater between the zahiri and batini so here they contend that because of the circumstances they have been in all their religious and spirituality has been internalized so it's more batini there is no expression outside because they could not and over a period of time this has become the norm so allah al but at the moment they have a problem next we come to the druze this is a very very um uh, interesting group the most famous or well known druze leader at the moment in lebanon uh, which some of you may have heard is a man called walid jumlat who lives in the druze mountains right they also have lot of linkages with mysticism and uh, the personality of imam ali alayhi salam although after that they have no following they have no practice and they have lots of other traditions which they create from christians and all kinds of other traditions um generally i don't think any leading scholar or personality has recognized them as muslims and they do not claim to be muslims however because they are partly sympathetic to imam ali they wouldn't go against the shia in lebanon this is the important point we want to bring because next we come to lebanon when you come to lebanon historically lebanon was after the mandate period ruled by a sort of informal triumvirate of sunni muslims and um maronite christians so and the shias were marginalized with some representation from druze and so on So when Said Musa Sadr came on the scene he started to work amongst the Shias in South Lebanon so because the, the Shias mostly are in South Lebanon and and as i mentioned to you there was a strong presence there uh, in the Jabal Amil region which is where the ulama went to Iran and other places and the, he started this campaign for empowerment of the Shia ultimately resulting in a completely new political dispensation for lebanon lebanon now cannot form a government without the consent of the shia and obviously you have the hezbollah and you have the amal uh, shia group and so now lebanon needs for its constitution to work that the president normally nominally should be a sunni muslim and the speaker should be a shia muslim and so on and so forth prime minister should be a sorry president should be a christian and the prime minister should be a sunni muslim but the power within that has shifted towards the shia without the shia consent nothing can happen in lebanon and this is thanks to said musa sadr and probably that's why he was kidnapped and changed now in this battle because the druz are quite a important part of lebanese Uh, culture and lebanese society the and also they are known as very good warriors and as opposed to the alawites it is interesting to know that the crusaders considered them to be the worst enemies 
because they really beat the crusaders to hell so on several occasions so whether not from a muslim point of view but just because this was their homeland so they are if you like in terms of military strength in lebanon the balance of power and they obviously sided with said musa and allowed the empowerment of the shia in fact walid jumlat was also instrumental in in accepting that uh, status quo so this led the establishment of the shia tradition in lebanon south lebanon now for the last 30 40 years it has been fully uh, enhanced and improved uh, we had uh, people like uh, sheikh uh, mehdi shamsuddin and said no sen fadlallah and now hasan nasrallah and so on uh, lots of scholars reestablishing the tradition because originally what had happened is that the scholars from iraq the small enclaves shia enclaves in iraq original ones used to go uh, come from lebanon and study there and go back to lebanon so lebanon was always a seat of learning and then they went from there to iran with the kizilbash and shah ismail uh, shah abbas sorry so this tradition is now being revived and you have good scholars like the late said musa and fadlullah who actually studied in najaf and came back said musa sadr who was from there the sadr family itself is between split between lebanon and iraq and iran some of them <coughs> so yes the druze although we normally and generally do not consider them to be part of the muslim fold and they themselves don't want to be known as such but they were instrumental in allowing the empowerment of the shia in lebanon so you see now when we look at these three uh, traditions which we have looked at the alawis the alawites and the druze we see that of course common in all of them is the love of imam ali alayhi salam and the ahlul bayt and in one way or another they have allowed the empowerment of the shia so for example even in syria now you wouldn't have uh, what you have in say zainab without the alawites in power if there were the other party in power they would never have allowed that in turkey in most mosques in contrast to all other sunni countries actually which i have seen you will at least see the name of imam ali imam hasan and hussein in mosques on on the main uh, dome in addition to the names of the first three caliphs you will see this three in other muslim countries you will not see and obviously with the sufi traditions you have that so this will then tie in with what will happen from here on to the role of iran in the region because it has a lot of sympathizers natural and those are strong and tomorrow we will see one more group which are the Uh, Zaydis in in Yemen which have a very similar role as well and then we can move towards some kind of an understanding of what will happen assalamu alaikum we have time for questions if there are any questions from either side assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum ikbar bhai Yeah, yeah, go on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, who are the Houthis then in Yemen? Yeah, so these are the Zaydis. Yeah? So oh, they are the Zaydis? Yeah, we will see tomorrow. Okay. These are the, the Houthi is a tribe. Okay. okay. Now, you said the Alawis are basically in t- uh, Turkey and Alawites in Syria. in Syria. But none of them actually, they all believe in the Quran, but they don't seem to practice. No. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, why are they expe- accepted as... Pop Muslims when they cannot follow the five pillars of Islam or seven I don't know 
So this will be, you see, as I said, there is a spectrum of how you look at it, right? You look at one is that, I'm saying I'm a Muslim, so you don't say to me you are not praying, right? No, but that's a personal thing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you say, I'm not seeing you as Muslim because you don't pray. <laughs> but I'm saying I'm a Muslim, so you have to make a judgment to say, look. So that's, as I said, that's a key problem and... Um, I don't see them also like some other groups moving towards better practice or more what we call acceptable practice. So they, they are where they are. And, and in Syria, the Alawites, because uh, they are in the army, they control the, the armed forces. That's why Bashar al-Sadat has got so much power. Yeah. Because of the force of the, of the army. Yeah. So it's not because of religion. Yeah, because it's because of... Uh, as I said, developments which allowed the army to be majority populated by these people who were too poor, so the only occupation they could find was join the army. But that has its own consequences. Thank you. Yes. From this side. Assalamu alaikum. Yesterday you mentioned uh, Sufi. Do you mind to explain a little bit about their beliefs? So, yes, we mentioned the Sufis and today also we mentioned a little bit about the Bektashi order, which is a Sufi order. There are many other Sufi orders. So, as, as uh, I said yesterday, but we can go over it a bit more and we will talk a little bit tomorrow as well. The <coughs> main, if you like, central theme of the Sufi tradition is what we call marifat or knowledge of Allah, personal knowledge of Allah. And another feature is that Sufis um, have their leadership from people who are actually authorized by their peers to uh, act as leaders. That's why, as I said, they always start with Imam Ali and go down and they have a chain of empowerment from one to the other until whatever it is. So even now the Sheikh will say, my successor will be so and so. So you will you learn the knowledge from them. The third thing is that <clears throat> there is a range of practice. Some of them think that because they have all this spiritual zikr and so on, they don't need to pray and fast. They've done their bit. Some of them pray and fast and do those things, right? Some of them have a quite a um, different kind of practice. So for example, you may have uh, seen or heard about the whirling dervishes in Turkey. These are also Sufi orders. Um, and uh, they are generally much more, uh, if you like, open. They don't sort of uh, judge you. You say, okay, you want to come and make zikr? Sit down. They don't ask you if you're praying or fasting or whatever. Um, so they are, yes, and they have been quite instrumental. We will see a little bit tomorrow in, in actually spreading Islam across different regions. So for example, if you look at North Africa and West Africa, there are two big Sufi orders who have spread Islam there. One is called the Tijaniya and the other one the Qadiriya. So Qadiriya of course derived their name from Abdul Qadir Jilani who is uh, also buried in, in Baghdad. And in uh, India and Pakistan, you have the Chishtiya, for example, from uh, this, uh, uh, from Ajmer, originally from Ajmer, and buried in Ajmer as well. Yes, so the Sufis vary, so we cannot say it's not like a one type of practice. It could be very, very conventional, plus zikr and things like that, and, and knowledge, to some people who just go into the stratosphere. So they believe, all of them, that if you have enough knowledge of Allah, Marifa, then eventually 
you will dissolve into Allah. They call this the, the phenomena of fana. You will become one with Allah. And that's it. Any final questions from either side before we start? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu. I was just wondering if you knew why it was the Alawis fast the first 10 days, did you say, of Muharram? Yeah, do you know why it is they did uh, that? Clearly, because of uh, uh, the events of Karbala. They believe in Karbala very well and they celebrate, I mean, they commemorate Ashura. So, yes, it's because of that. And they, uh, they have these uh, special dishes which they make on Ashura for breaking the fast after Zohar and so on, yes. So, yes, it is because of that. It's not because they fast three days in February, I think, on some other occasion, but that's related to some other traditional uh, thing. But this one is definitely rooted in, Kar in Karbala. They do. Yeah. Yeah. So they say that uh, you are reading it wrong. Okay. I think cool. Okay. Final question. On Friday, inshallah. <laughs> We will put it on the online so you can see it, inshallah. Okay, I think we'll end the salawat.